Welcome everyone to the Bloodthirsty Word. This is the Thirsty Word reading series and um, my friend Dave Patterson uh, inspired me with the idea of making this event a spooky one again and uh, I'm glad he did because it's a lot of fun to dive into the dark side of life. <laughs> um, we are a monthly reading series. We do this every third Thursday and um, uh, uh, we like to feature writers of every ilk, whether they're hobby writers or widely published authors, we've got it all in Fairfield. So it's really fun to have five or six people get up, share what they've been working on for an audience and have a little fun and, and, do, and do something creative. And uh, my God, we're together, isn't that cool? Um, my name is Meredith and I'm your host. And um, Special thanks, before I forget, to uh, uh, Werner Elmker, who agreed to f film this night for posterity. Maybe blackmail, we'll see. And, uh, <laughs> and, um, and Dave Patterson for helping make this night uh, a, such a fun one. Uh, I think we'll get started uh, with a little uh, light appetizer, if you will. Dave. <laughs> Uh, yeah, hi, David Patterson. This is called uh, Café Goulet. <clears throat> Are you tired, half dead, sick of being at home? Are you missing that spark of life, weary in your bones? Has your family become zombies, for that is how it seems? Well, our house is your house. Please ignore the screams. Ah, my friends, an introduction, if you please. Welcome to Café Goulet. I am Chef Rigor Mortis. <laughs> we invite you to join us for a nibble or a bite. We are here seven days a week. We open at midnight. Here at Café Goulet, we encourage you to gorge. Our location, you ask? Right next to the county mall. So gather up your loved ones, drive down in the family hearse. We'll greet you and we'll eat, uh, <clears throat> seat you, <laughs> and bring you a drink to quench your thirst. Now, we have no wine or vodka, Michelob or Bud, just a bubbly concoction of seltzer and fresh drawn blood. There are no menus for you to browse, but you'll be glad to know we don't harm any chickens, pigs, or cows. Enjoy the ambiance, soft and cool, like a, like a darkened cave. On the table, black candles and flowers from the grave. Smell the succulent aroma seeping from our vats. Hear the cackle in the kitchen, the scurrying of rats. We'll begin with our bone broth soup, served scalding hot, full of bunions, corns, and warts, with a dollop of creamy snot. <laughs> or perhaps a fresh tossed salad is more your fare. Sun-dried toes and pickled ears on a bed of human hair. And a treat for the kiddies they'll think is quite the boss. Fresh fried fingers with sweet saliva dripping sauce. Our appetizer list is quite extensive. Oh, where to begin? Crispy kidney crepes wrapped tight in wrinkled skin. We welcome foodies, but we do not welcome snobs. You haven't lived until you've tasted pineapple and eyeball kebabs. My personal favorite, made with a certain kind of flair, a five ounce filet of tongue served warm, wet, and rare. Or a cold dish, something safe, but not too dull, I suggest the lumpy brain pate served in a nice chilled skull. And what of our entrees? Do you prefer something hearty or something light? We guarantee our meats are sawed off fresh every night. For instance, our breaded cutlet is cooked to suit your taste. Prime choice tenderloin cut just below the waist. Something exotic? Please don't be afraid. 
of our blackened lungs served with a mucus marmalade. Or a spicy dish is more your kind of style. Try our liver meatballs, glazed with chili, oil, and bile. <laughs> and we have our signature pasta dish, linguine a la remains. The sauce is thickened with cremation ash, the noodles made with veins. And my specialty, the dish I love to make, sink your teeth into my mouth-watering flaming juicy butt steak. <laughs> Once you've had your fill, the dessert cart will arrive. I'm proud to say some things are rotten, some are still alive. <laughs> oh, where to start? A lavender cadaver tart? I see that look in your eye. You want a slice of Adam's apple pie. Or our take on cannoli with a hint of vanilla bean. The cream is made from belly fat filled inside a crispy spleen. A red hot souffle for the lady of your life? Hold it in your bloodied hands and feed it to your wife. When it's time for the check, no need to scream or beg. Our prices are quite reasonable. It only costs an arm or a leg. So come on down to Cafe Goulet, whether casually or formally dressed, you'll come back again and again as if you were possessed. <laughs> That's the only piece other than the one that I wrote for this evening that I saw in advance. Disclaimer, I don't know what's going to come at you this evening, but I did ask the writers to try and keep it PG. But when that thing came across my desk, um, I was howling in the office. The eyeballs and pineapple kebabs, <laughs> my favorite part. Thank you, Dave. We'll hear a little more from him a little later in the evening. And now, a very special treat, um, local author, Tim Pelton. Come to the stage. Oh my. Did that work for you? That, no, the, oh, the, oh, I see. They're little lights. Although, if they'll blind the audience I don't, if they're not. Oh, if they're not down. Oh, okay. I'll just try to, all right. There'll, <laughs> there'll be some tr hassle of turning pages where I don't run into it. Oh, yeah. But okay. All right. Uh, this is called Drones. This is Joe the Night Stalker on WXRB and we've been talking to George 65. Thanks for giving us a call and sharing your theory that birds are not living creatures but they are actually drones controlled by the government and sent to spy on us. I didn't say all of them, just the bigger... Well, it looked like we're out of time for this segment. Stay tuned, because we're going to get to the whole Sasquatch controversy. George held the receiver out in front of his face and yelled at it. And I didn't say it was the government. It might be the damned CIA or even the Ruskies. How the hell would I know? He slammed the receiver down into the phone cradle and growled at it. He went to the window, picked up the binoculars that hung around his neck, and put them to his eyes. Although the sun had gone down, he could see the silhouette of a hawk circling slowly in the evening breeze. I see you, you son of a bitch, George muttered. Why are you casing the hospital? Is something going on over there I don't know? He studied the Tucker County Hospital just across the boulevard. Five years before, there had been a tobacco field over there, and now it was all concrete and glass high buildings and paved parking lots. Unlike some of his neighbors, George hadn't minded when construction on the hospital began. There were a few things that the government put its money into that didn't get George hot under the collar, and hospitals were one of them. Before he turned on his computer, he pulled down the shade on the window. No use giving them damn drones a free look into my business, is there, Rusty? George said to his old retriever. He reached down and scratched the dog's head and the back of his neck. Rusty didn't get up. Instead, he thumped his tail against the floor to show his pleasure. George slid into the chair in front of the laptop and within a few minutes was in a chat room when a shirt-tail website called 
spybirds.com. Comparing notes with his friends Redram42 and They Don't Fool Me. Two hours later, Rusty heaved himself up onto his feet, hobbled over to his food dish, and then looked up at George expectantly. The old man typed, Gotta go, signed out, and shut off his computer. After he had finished spooning out dog food into Rusty's dish and had straightened up, he felt a slight sting on the back of his neck. He slapped himself in the back of the head and looked at his hand, but did not see the expected dead insect. Then he felt something whir past his ear. Spinning around, George saw what appeared to be a giant mosquito up in the air near the ceiling. Rusty noticed it and began to bark. The old man picked up a newspaper from the coffee table and, without taking his eyes off the insect, rolled the paper into a tube. All right, you little bastard, George said. Get ready to die. For the next five minutes, there was a chase around the room. George swinging his newspaper club and the bug just staying out of reach. Finally, the insect flew behind the curtain over the kitchen window. George, his newspaper ready for the death blow, jerked back the curtain, but nothing was there. Damn it, Rusty, he got away. He was reaching for the dog's leash when his neck began to itch. He scratched at it idly. Hey, Rusty, want to go for a walk? The dog arfed happily as he came up and bumped the old man's leg. When George reached out to pick up the leash from its hook, he saw that his fingertips were covered with blood. What the devil, he muttered to himself as he ducked into the bathroom for to look in the mirror. The back of his neck was smeared with blood. As he watched, little blisters formed on the side of his neck, grew in size, and then split open, causing trickles of blood to run down and stain the collar of his t-shirt. Poison, George gasped. I've been poisoned. That wasn't no bug. It was a damn drone, and it jabbed me with something. What the hell can I do? Who can I call? I'll be dead before they get here. He pulled up the window shade and looked across the street. The main entrance to the hospital was directly across the street, but to the south was another entrance that had big, bright red capital letters over the door. Emergency. I'll just run across the street. I can be there in five minutes. They'll know what to do. George was halfway out the front door when he stepped back into the house and jerked open the drawer in the end table. He pulled out a Smith & Wesson 442 revolver and gripped it tight. He felt better with the cold weight of it in his hand. Safer, somehow. Jerking open the door, he stepped out into the darkness. Before the screen door could slam, Rusty was out and running down the drive. The old man tried to run, too, but arthritis in his knees and hips kept him to a hobbling walk. The itch that had started on the back of his neck had spread down to his shoulder and up the side of his head and was beginning to burn. When George got to the end of the drive, he had to wait for a few agonizing minutes for a break in the traffic. A searing stab of pain lanced down his back and forced him into motion. With a dog beside him, he scurried across the street, ignoring the sounds of honking horns, squealing brakes, and angry curses. George reached the far curb and fell to his hands and knees on the grassy verge. Rusty kept running. The old man looked up and saw the brightly lit emergency room door up ahead and staggered to his feet. There was a drainage ditch that he'd have to cross before he got to the hospital lawn itself. Further down the street was the driveway, which could be an easier walk, but it would take more time. Then he heard Rusty bark down in the gully, then howl with pain. Rusty! The old man yelled as he hobbled down the hill. In the darkness, he could see something moving. When he got closer, what he saw made him want to retch. His dog was sprawled on the grass, dead, with his head split open. A large black bird with glowing red eyes was perched on Rusty's neck, plucking gobbets of meat out of the wound and eating them. You son of a bitch, George screamed as he leveled the gun at the bird and pulled the trigger. He missed, and with a rattle of feathers, the creature flapped its way up into the dark. George jerked the trigger twice more, but the burning pain in his arm made his hand shake and the shots went wide. The old man ran to the body of his dog and reached down to stroke his fur for the one last time. Suddenly, the dog's eyelids popped open. Glowing red pupils focused on George. In an instant, the hound had the old man's hand clamped in his jaws, his teeth 
quickly broke through the skin, the skin and the dog started ripping the flesh off the bones. George screamed and tried to pull his hand away, but the pain only increased in desperation. He pressed the pistol against the dog's chest and pulled the trigger. His hand came free. Weeping now, he cradled his mangled hand in the crook of his elbow and staggered up the hill. At the top, he paused long enough to see the emergency room entrance and then shambled toward it as quickly as he could. By now, he was only 20 feet away. There was an ambulance in front of the doors. A wailing siren came up the drive and patrol car, blue and red lights flashing, skidded to a halt. Two cops jumped out. Help! George shouted, help me, they're trying to kill me. Instead of running to his assistance, the cops scrambled behind their car and shined a spotlight into his eyes. Drop your weapon, said an amplified voice. All right, but if I do, they'll attack me, George yelled. You have to shoot them before they get me. Just drop the gun, then we'll take care of you. George opened his hand and the pistol fell to the ground. There was a screech and he looked up to see the big black bird diving straight at his chest. The impact knocked him backwards and he fell. Just as he hit the ground, he felt the dog's jaws clamp down on his throat. He struggled, but it was only a few moments before sight and sound melted away like film in a broken projector, leaving only black silence. Mick and Larry, the two EMTs that were staffing the ambulance that night, had been hiding behind their vehicle. As soon as the old man dropped the gun, they picked up their equipment cases and ran toward him. By the time the cops caught up with them, Mick was on his knees, pumping the old man's chest on a, in a CPR cadence while Larry pressed an oxygen mask over the mouth. After a few minutes of this, they looked at each other and shook their heads. I gotta tell you, Mick said as he repacked his case, I've never seen such a look of sheer terror on a man's pay face before, living or dead. We heard all that screaming about they're trying to kill me, said Larry, but look, there's not a mark on him. Suddenly there was a loud rattle and flap of feathers as a large bird took off from the roof over the portico and flew up into the night sky. Thank you so much, Tim. It's the first time I've ever seen him in person and honored to have you at my event. There was a wonderful article about Tim um, and a novel he wrote about his um, misadventures in college. Um, look him up uh, on the Iowa Source website. It's, it's a blast to read about. Um, all right, next up we have my dear friend and super talented creative writer, uh, Chloe Hennessy. Give her a round of applause. Hello. How are you folks this evening? Good. I mean, that's a rhetorical question. I'm the one that's talking. So um, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to read something that wasn't quite what I intended to write tonight, but I was sort of inspired by the wind from last evening. So um, this is the winds of October. Should I use the mic so that you can hear me better? Yeah. yeah is that better? Can you guys hear me? OK. <clears throat> It is, a it, it is windy tonight in your old house on the hill. The gusts are much stronger than you read they would be when you checked the forecast earlier in anticipation of rain. Like a hard drenching downpour, the wind swells endlessly, rushing and rushing, and you can't remember when it even started. Your weather app is useless at predicting just when it will end. All you can do is check the hourly forecast 46% chance of rain now until 10 p.m. with winds up to 16 miles per hour. 51% chance until 11 p.m. winds up to 27%, uh, 27 miles per hour. 49% chance until midnight winds up to 36 miles per hour. If there comes a warning for a tornado tonight and you're sleeping, will you even know before it's too late? Where will you go if there is such a beast? Your basement harbors the possibility of fugitive snakes, perhaps hidden amongst loose rope you won't put away, quite possibly under soggy, moldy boxes you won't touch, 
slithering from cracks in the sill plate atop the weeping cinder block foundation. You would rather die in a whoosh and a wham of an angry whirlwind before descending those stairs. A truth you keep tucked away in the back of your mind that peeks out now as you contemplate your demise. There is no word from your weather app when the power goes out. Your phone isn't that smart. It still only says rain might be coming and that the wind could be strong. You were in the dark before the power went out and now it feels more sinister because it's no longer in your control. You have no choice of seeing anything clearly. And while there is the light on your phone, you look down to realize it only charged a 6% before the power went out. It's like being at sea, you tell yourself. You are adrift and at the mercy of the squalls now yowling outside your glass portal windows. And this is the will of the unknown world. It strains to get at you, and most of the time you are unaware. Most days you are oblivious of your absolute powerlessness, but you can be made to feel it here and now, in your own home, nuzzled within your favorite fuzzy blanket, surrounded by pictures of your family and your clean but unfolded laundry in the baskets around your bed. The ashes of your dearly departed dog, Paul, on the shelf near your bed felt comforting before, and now it just feels weird that he's among the various inanimate objects that might be the last things you consider before you're swept off into a doomed death by night tornado. Did you hear about how she died? They'll say. Her body was found in the next town over. Yeah. She was clutching some kind of pet urn and covered in flecks of dead dog dust. Outside, the wind has become furious. The howling as unnerving as the thoughts of your room's contents whipping around you as you're carried off by a twister. Perhaps you should tape the lid shut just in case. But you can't be looking for tape right now, so you decide to just move it to another room. Does considering where you're going mean that you're lost? Is it possible to lose your way in your own bedroom? Because now that you're standing, you feel unsure of the exact placement of the urn in relation to where you were. Was it on the nightstand or on the shelf just beyond? You feel for the wall, expecting it to be close, but it's not there. And a small space begins to form in your mind, a dark, expanding room of impossible notions. What if the wall has moved? What if this isn't your room? What if it no longer belongs to you because you cannot see it? Did it ever really belong to you? Does anything really belong to you? What if you can't find your way what if the wind wants you to fail? You are ridiculous, you think to yourself, shaking your head. This wind hasn't won yet. So shifting your weight, you try again, reaching forth for a flat surface, and that's when you knock something off into the somewhere you cannot see. Perhaps it was an empty mug, maybe a book. Is now the time to use up some of the 6% of your phone life? How long does the power usually go out for? And as you try and recall the last time it happened, you remember you have a battery-operated charger in your backpack and the wind that batters the sanctity of your home and mind feels as if it ebbs a little bit. Yes, finally, a little solace in the eye of the storm that is but a simple struggle to not become a terrible story. You feel empowered by the notion your backpack contains a cure to your helplessness. But where is your backpack? Is it even in this room or is it downstairs somewhere? Is it in a closet? Surely this is the time to use your phone's flashlight. This is a legit search. You can risk using up a little of its juice. But now, where is your phone exactly? It is not in your hand, and you feel no weight in your po pajama pockets. It was right with you seconds ago. You just had it. You just had it. So you reach down to pat blindly on your bed, your fingertips dredging through some sort of grainy grit. And you freeze in this moment back slightly bent, hands hovering just above the rumpled surface of your bed, taking in the fullness of this suddenly hushed moment. Your hands are now covered in dusty dog cremains, remnants of your once good boy, Paul. He is now, as he was in life, all over your bed, his essence on your pillows, covering your phone with his body. It is so quiet now, the wind having swept any trace of itself into the distant shadows of muted treetops and bent prairie grass. And while you are currently living inside a small version of what you were trying to avoid, the fear of being powdered in Paul, 
the stark stillness of reality. <laughs> the stark stillness of your reality feels bitter and personal. <clears throat> You've lived in this house for 10 years at least. You've stumbled these floors in worse stupors than this, and yet the power goes out and all your good cow sense with it. These winds and the impotent terror of the night tornadoes of October have won after all. The power is still off, even though the potential threat has passed, but you have been bested by yourself in your own nightmare fantasies. So you release yourself from your stiff pose over your bed and sink to the floor, your hands dusted in the death particles of your old best friend, and you resign yourself to a night of sleeping on the dark, cold floor. Thank you so much, Chloe. I want to read that again sometime. Uh, I was distracted because I was trying to get a hold of our uh, fifth reader, and he's not feeling well and can't come tonight. So I'm heartbroken. Uh, but the good news is you can go get in your cozy beds a little earlier tonight. So you're welcome, I guess. Um, all right, uh, we've got uh, some more uh, disgusting treats coming up. No, not, not that disgusting. Uh, some more pieces coming up from Dave Patterson, our resident ghoul. Yeah, just a couple quick ones, a quick poem and a little flash fiction. Um, Take all the time you need. <laughs> read it slow. <coughs> uh, this is a poem <coughs> uh, titled, Well Lit is Her Gravestone. Well lit is her gravestone by a blood hunter's moon, our love buried beneath where her body's been laid. The night grows colder, I'll be holding her soon. What's severed shall be whole, free her soul with my spade. Our love buried beneath where her body's been laid, digging down digging, oh how her coffin is deep. What's severed shall be whole, free her soul with my spade. To kiss her cold lips, will she awaken from sleep? Digging down digging, oh how her coffin is deep, pry open the lid, my bleeding heart is aflame. To kiss her cold lips, will she awaken from sleep? Breathtakingly brittle, her beautiful remains. Pry open the lid, my bleeding heart is aflame. Dance slowly entwined, lonely wind moans a tune. Breathtakingly brittle, her beautiful remains. Well lit is her gravestone by a blood hunter's moon. And this, uh, this is a short story called Meat. <laughs> Kingston sat up in bed. A noise had disturbed his sleep. Was it a scream? He was now wide awake. The room was unusually dark. Must be a night without a moon, he thought. He got out of bed and found his robe bunched up on the floor. He went to the window and pulled back the black bed sheet he used as a curtain. He could see nothing outside in the darkness not even the picnic table where he smoked cigarettes. The night was still, lifeless. He heard the noise again. It was a familiar sound, but from where, he didn't know. The security light turned on and Kin Kingston stepped back from the window. A large black dog limped into the yard as if it were wounded. Kingston reached for the curtain, but something prevented him from doing so. The dog raised its head, a mangy beast with red eyes. Kingston wanted his rifle, but it was locked in the gun safe and he was too full of fear to move. The dog bared its teeth but did not growl. It seemed to know him. It was then that Kingston knew. It had all been written before, on walls and in stone, an ancient sacred longing as strong as the earth. Kingston walked out into the night. The grass was cold and wet on his bare feet. He went to the dog and stood before him. The dog nudged him with his wet nose and Kingston obeyed and followed him into the dark woods. The dog smelled of rot and decay. Kingston was blind in the darkness, but could hear the dog sniffing the ground and panting. The dog stopped and raised its head and howled, alarming in the night. Other dogs returned the call. It sounded like the laughter of madmen, Kingston thought. 
Kingston knew he should run, but like a victim in a nightmare, his legs became heavy and unwilling. The dog led him into a clearing. Suddenly, the clouds thinned, and the dim light of a waning moon lit the area before him, casting shadows from a patch of birch trees that looked like slanted ghosts. They came as one animal. A pack of gaunt, malnourished dogs approached slowly, surrounding him with raw urgency. Their hot breath rose like steam in the dampness of the night. Kingston tightened his rope around him. The dogs howled one last time. <laughs>